As you can see, my talk's going to be about uh, computer forensics and electronic discovery. Um, I thought I'd sort of um, mix it up a little bit. I mean, uh, it's been a it's been a, a pretty full-on conference with some pretty deep dive, very technical talks. So um, this one's not going to be so technical. I'm not going to be um, exploding anyone's heads with medical devices or um, or um, uh, you know doing any any demos that make your laptops explode. Um, what it's more going to be about is um, is the kind of work that I do and the kind of industry that I work in, and um, which is. Um, in some ways quite uh, different to uh, the, the standard sort of computer forensics, but I'll, uh, I'll explain that to you anyway. Um, but yeah, my name's Adam Daniel, so um, I specialise in computer forensics and, uh, and electronic discovery. Um, as I said, my name's Adam Daniel, I'm also known as, uh, as Rivals or, uh, or Loser by my workmates. Uh, Simon's not even in here, is he? Nah, he bailed. Um, Anyway, um, my background is in uh, data recovery and, uh, and data conversion. Um, a lot of people who do um, computer forensics um, tend to come from a law enforcement or investigation background, um, whereas a lot of the, uh, the other guys and a lot of the guys that I've worked with, um, like guys like Vincent over there, I see, who used to work with my old, uh, my old company, Forensic Data Services, we come from a very technical sort of um, uh, you know, file system uh, recovery background. Um, so it's more the technical skills came first and then the investigation skills came later as opposed to the other way around, which is what you, you tend to see in the computer forensics world. Um, uh, I've got 18 years experience. I've probably got more, but I just sort of pulled that figure out of my head. I uh, started working in, um, in computing in 1992, um, doing a floppy disk uh, conversion and, uh, and floppy disk recovery, which is where I started learning about file systems and sort of moved on from there. Um, as you probably guessed, I'm one of the original RuxCon crew. We've been doing this since 2003. So uh, thank you everyone for coming along to RuxCon. Um, and at the moment I'm a manager at, uh, at Ernst & Young. Um, I was at uh, Deloitte before that. And before that I was at a, a small uh, boutique firm called uh, Forensic Data Services, which was one of the only uh, computer forensic um, you know, providers um, you know, in, in the old days kind of thing. Um, and, um, and they were bought by Deloitte, and then from Deloitte I sort of started working for Ernst & Young. So, uh, so now I work for, uh, for a big accounting firm. Um, so um, I wanted to just quickly sort of talk about where computer forensics fits into accounting firms. Um, as you guys probably know, Ernst & Young is one of the sponsors of this, uh, of this event, and, um, and primarily because the... Um, um, uh, because of uh, effectively because of the advisory and risk side of um, of accounting, um, which is where a lot of the pen testers and um, you know and a lot of the, the people that are in the security industry sort of tend to be in. Um, whereas myself, we are actually in the uh, the assurance and audit area. Um, I actually work for uh, the fraud investigation and dispute services area. So. Um, uh, what we do is, is, is slightly different. We don't um, tend to deal with a lot of, um, you know, uh, penetrations and, uh, and that type of investigation. Um, I know a lot of the guys that I used to work with are now working for like uh, smaller firms, do a lot of, you know, PCI investigation and SQL injection and stuff like that. We don't tend to see a lot of that sort of work. Um, we tend to deal, you know, um, almost purely in, um, in fraud and, uh, and, and that type of stuff. So. Um, so yeah, traditionally, um, you know, there's there's really sort of two forks in uh, in accounting firms of of you know of IT expertise, and and there does does tend to be a, a lot of crossover as well. So uh, for instance, if you see Daniel's talk tomorrow, um, uh, which is uh, basically a, a, about reverse engineering a a piece of software, he basically th did that in conjunction with one of the FIDS guys. Um, so it was a, a joint um, forensic and advisory investigation. So um, where I work is, uh, as I say, is in the, uh, the, uh, the FIDS area, um, which is the uh, Fraud Investigation Dispute Services. And, um, and mainly it's, it's dealing with, um, with all types of fraud, like um, um, you know, bank fraud, um, uh, you know, like, yeah, I could go on and on, I guess, about the type of fraud that we do. Um, but it's mainly fraud investigation, so there's a lot of interviews, you know, like um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, dispute services, so um, they look at disputes and quantify sort of damages and stuff like that in, uh, in, in disputes. Um, there's a lot of anti-fraud sort of services that we do in re relation to like anti-fraud analytics and, um, you know, and, and, and putting anti-fraud measures into place. Place. Um, corporate compliance, um, which I don't really deal with very much. Government contract services, so um, you know we we'll, we'll look at a lot of contracts and the way that they're actually set up, and um, and obviously insurance claim support as well, which I've got written down there as well, um, which is it's the same sort of thing. It's sort of quantifying, you know, insurance claims, um, figuring out whether or not they're they're fraudulent, um, stuff along those lines. And the area that I actually work in is uh, the forensic technology and discovery services, um, 
And forensic technology and discovery services, um, we, we kind of have a bit of a special place in that we, um, we, we kind of encompass all of those areas and, um, and all of the people who work for those other areas tend to rely on us to, to provide all of the technical support for, for all of their investigations and, and, and stuff along those lines. So. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. Um, we, instead of dealing with the, the small sort of narrower um, forensic investigations, we tend to deal with a lot larger, um, uh, you know, corporate-based investigations, which, um, which tend to deal with a lot bigger data sets, a lot more custodians, um, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, so what we do, forensic technology and discovery services, obviously we do um, computer forensics. Um, it's a very sort of uh, brief three lines on what computer forensics potentially is, but uh, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, we do electronic discovery as well, which is um, sort of an emerging field, but uh, has, has been around for quite some time. It's, it's based on the old sort of uh, paper-based sort of litigation um, type stuff, so I'll go into that a little bit more as well. And, um, and the other thing that we provide in, uh, in FDS is, um, uh, is, uh, is forensic data uh, analytics, which is uh, we basically have a bunch of database boffins and um, who, uh, who who sit there and, uh, and just like uh, they're just mathematical geniuses that come up with uh, with all kinds of crazy tests that we can run over huge accounting sets to um, you know detect anomalies and uh, and fraud and, and and stuff along those lines by um, you know de detecting you know different stuff in transactions and stuff. Um, but my um, my area of, of expertise is in uh, computer forensics and electronic discovery. So uh, that's mainly what I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to be going into any uh, any SAS or SQL stuff. Thank God. Um, also, I should say, um, uh, if any, did anyone see my talk like two years ago? No. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, two years ago, I actually uh, I did a, I did a talk, and I was so hungover that uh, that I almost actually collapsed on stage. Um, none of my uh, none of my slides actually worked. Uh, I was running X Windows, couldn't get it running through the projector. Um, none of my demos worked, and uh, and yeah, like it, it all just went pretty pear shaped. But um, I think some people got something out of it. But um, but yeah, it was it was a bit of a nightmare. And uh, and I, I promised myself that I was never going to do that again. And you know, I'd, I'd be on point for my talk this time. And um, um, so last night I didn't drink, um, but foolishly I actually stayed upstairs in the uh, in the the disco room um, and uh, and my room was actually vibrating the uh, the whole night so um, I've had uh, exactly one and a half hours sleep which is after the, the club finished um, so if I actually pass out on the floor um, my room number is 409 if you could just take me up there and put me in bed um, if I wake up halfway through my talk and uh, and I'm in bed then then thank you whoever that person is um, so um, computer forensics, just a quick one on, on computer forensics and what it actually is, um, well, what it is that we actually deal with in relation to computer forensics. Um, um, so, you know, the Verizon guys and stuff like that, they tend to deal with, um, as I say, a lot of uh, data breach investigations, um, whereas, whereas we tend to deal with um, more narrow focused type uh, fraud based investigations. Um, uh, I've done a lot of IT expert witness in my, in my time. Um, I've, I've done a lot of court time uh, providing expert witness for, um, for all kinds of matters from murder cases, child pornography cases, um, you know, I uh, even gave uh, evidence in the this big C7 litigation on, uh, on backdating Word documents and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. So that tends to be a, lo um, a lot of the stuff that we do. Expert uh, report writing, obviously, which sort of goes along with that. Um, covert data capture, so, um, you know, <laughs> no, no, no real need to go into that, but we do actually do a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, hardcore forensic imaging uh, where we go out and we'll, we can image entire organisations almost in a night. Um, plus we have um, a lot of technology as well where we can actually push, um, you know, like a, a services out to people's computers and actually image your computer while you're sitting on there. So if you're, uh, if you're plugged into your company network and your hard drive starts thrashing, it might be a virus scan or it might be us imaging your computer remotely. Um, warrant execution as well, so um, um, we, we help a lot of um, different law enforcement agencies um, execute warrants. Uh, ASIC would be one of them, ACCC, um, and uh, you know, people like the Department of uh, um, Immigration and Citizenship. Um, they tend to execute a lot of warrants in relation to fraud and, and stuff along those lines. So um, we, we tend to be the independent experts that actually go in and, um, you know, and, and actually perform the imaging uh, along with the AFP and uh, another law enforcement. And, um, and as I put down the bottom, we, uh, we um, computer forensics does tend to follow the, the standard practices of um, you know of forensic science. So um, you know uh, every touch leaves a trace. Um, we we do a lot of testing to try to disprove our own theories, especially if we're uh, going to be presenting evidence in court. And um, and obviously the the main really important things about what we do is uh, is defendability and, and the fact that you know you can you can um, you know prove what you've done is 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 legitimate and uh, and you've done it in the right way um, you know and, and chain of custody is obviously a major part of that. 
So, um, so that's computer forensics. Electronic discovery, on the other hand, is um, is slightly different. Um, it's sort of it's sort of born out of litigation support. Um, it's a lot of data processing, like large-scale data processing for, um, uh, for review and data exchange. Um, we do have a lot of uh, document exchange protocols. There, um, um, there are uh, different protocols that have been set, like uh, I've got uh, practice note CM6 up there um, by the, the federal courts and the, uh, and the state courts in relation to how you can actually exchange data and the way that you should be exchanging data. Um, and so, uh, so we have to understand those, um, you know, um, how they, they actually work and, and the best way that we can actually exchange data. And uh, a lot of the new stuff that's um, that's coming in with with electronic discovery, because um, you know we're dealing with such massive data sets, is um, is some of the really interesting stuff, which is the the sentiment analysis, the um, the email threading type stuff, um, near deduplication, um, concept clustering, and uh, social network analysis, which um, I'll go into a little bit later. Um, but they're sort of the more sort of advanced sort of um, emerging technology that are coming out now with, uh, with electronic discovery. Um, hopefully I'm not talking too fast. I don't want to finish this in 10 minutes. Okay, so um, uh, with computer forensics and electronic discovery, there's obviously a lot of crossover of, uh, of discipline, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's been a, um, you know, a natural sort of progression for us to sort of move from, um, from forensic investigation into large-scale electronic discovery and still being able to do you know, the, the sort of narrow-based, smaller uh, forensic investigation as well. Um, as I say, a lot of the people in um, uh, computer forensics come out of the law enforcement agen um, agencies. A lot of the people out of uh, electronic discovery, um, you know, uh, traditionally sort of come out of litigation support, out of the actual law firms and supporting the law firms and you know scanning documents and presenting them to, um, you know, to, to lawyers and stuff to actually have a look at. Look at. So. Um, the crossover sort of skill sets that we have is um, obviously uh, collection. Um, everyone has to get data from somewhere. So um, with both computer forensics and e-discovery, collection is, uh, is a primary focus of the stuff that we actually do. And a lot of the, uh, the talk that, um, well, a lot of the, this talk is going to be based around collection and how um, some of the new emerging technologies affect the way that we actually collect data and, um, and how we can actually collect data. Um, maintaining the uh, chain of custody, that's pretty obvious. Um, audit logging, a lot of the, uh, um, both the computer forensic software we use and the electronic uh, discovery software we use has um, a lot of audit logging in the back end so that we can actually figure out um, what people are actually doing, when they've actually done it. Um, as you're progressing through investigations, what, um, you know, it logs every sort of click that you actually do, every um, search that you um, do, stuff along those lines. So that's one of the standard sort of things. Um, file signature analysis, um, no one relies on uh, uh, file extensions anymore, thank God. Um, so, which is basically, you know, looking at the uh, the magic file numbers, um, you know, the Unix file command. Um, it's uh, effectively uh, both forensic technology uh, programs and uh, electronic discovery both use um, file signature analysis uh, um, very heavily. Um, internal file structure analysis, so the extraction of, uh, of metadata and, um, and, uh, and other sort of internal data structures from within um, static data. Um, and compound file extraction, um, you know, which is basically drilling into to zip files, PST files, um, EDB files, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, timeline analysis is also um, something that's very important for both electronic discovery and for computer forensics um, when you're trying to rebuild a, uh, you know, um, a sequence of events of, of what's actually happened and how it's happened, why it's happened, and then uh, narrowly focus in on specific documents and specific files that, uh, that relate to, to certain incidents. Um, Date range filtering, of course, is it's pretty much the same sort of thing. Um, checksum generation, which is, um, you know, uh, everyone knows, um, you know, the MD5, SHA-1 sort of uh, checksumming. Um, we use uh, checksumming in both electronic discovery and computer forensics, like, a huge amount. Um, you know, pretty much everything we do gets checksummed from, from the imaging to, to extracting files to creating live, um, you know, image sets. Everything uh, has, has checksums, and there's a number of reasons we actually use that. Um, deduplication is an, is an obvious one. You only want to look at a document once. You don't want to look at it, you know, uh, the five of the same document. Um, verification that, that um, you know the, the the document that you have captured hasn't changed in any way, and the uh, the image that you've captured hasn't changed in any way. Um, Denisting. Has anyone heard of what NIST is? The NIST database. 
Um, well, the NIST database is basically a, um, it's a, a database of known binaries, um, which is a, it's a, a, a giant di digest, basically, a checksum digest of, of known uh, Windows binaries. And uh, one of the first things we do, and one of the, it's really handy for us, obviously, is because when we're uh, imaging whole laptops, one of the, the things we don't really want to look at is, is, is the standard binaries that we know are always going to be, exist on a Windows system. We want to eliminate those straight away. And, um, and it's very much the same with, um, uh, with eDiscovery as well. Um, Denisting is one of the first things that gets run over to a data set to just purge all that, that crap out of it that we never want to see. Um, keyword searching is actually obviously an, in, um, a, an obvious one um, for both computer forensics and electronic discovery. Um, we, uh, the software is now more and more relying on, um, on, on, on the speed of the actual database in the back end. Um, so um, most of the stuff that we do um, will actually run like an indexing engine over, um, you know, of, over the entire data set, pulling apart, as I, as I mentioned before, pulling apart all the metadata, um, indexing all of the text items within the actual, um, you know, the documents themselves, and, uh, and, and then putting that in a database so that we can actually um, quickly search and query and actually pull up quick results from. Um, once we've actually done that, um, we can then start doing some some pretty you know flash stuff around the actual uh, the searches themselves. Um, Boolean queries. I've got regex there as well, um, which you know st still sort of melts my brain sometimes when you've uh, you know you've got a, a regex sort of expression that's this long. Um, and we do a lot of um, advanced uh, search syntax stuff as well. So um, there's actually um, one of the main sort of uh, indexing programs that people use is uh, is called DT Search. Um, and DT Search has a lot of, um, of, of really cool sort of um, you know um, syntax in it that you can actually use, like a wildcards uh, proximity searching, for instance. So you can search for one word within 20 words of another word, um, or you can search for one word and a variable, and then another word within 20 words of another word, and, and so on and so forth. So um, you can actually do some very very powerful searching, um, and and tends to be one of the primary focuses of um, of, of most of the actual work that we do, and. Um, and advanced text analytics as well, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, is actually something that's being used in um, in both all of the major sort of um, you know computer forensics programs, as well as all of the the, the major uh, e-discovery processing uh, programs and, and hosting platforms at the moment. Um, uh, and a lot of that stuff is 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 to basically speed up review and and speed up the actual analysis by um, by extracting you know um, data like credit card numbers, um, which is the sort of the anti-extraction extraction stuff like credit card numbers, domain names, um, stuff like that. So we can actually, um, you know, drill into that quite quickly. Um, social network analysis, which um, is not us, you know, trawling through Facebook and just going, "Whoa, look at this guy's picture." Um, it's actually um, more us sort of constructing maps of the way that people actually talk to each other, um, who they're actually talking to, um, when they're actually talking to them, um, you know, and, and the kind of topics that they're actually talking about. And uh, and concept clustering, which is um, which is uh, some really high end sort of um, you know analytics database type stuff, where um, uh, where it basically builds like a, a very advanced sort of uh, analytics um, index, and then uses that to actually um, uh, cluster um, particular concepts together. But I'll uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, so the technology tidal wave. I just I came up with this when I was um, uh, one night when I was uh, com completely lacking of sleep. And um, I, I don't know why I sort of called it. That. I, I figured it was a better title than the one I had before, which just was just something about computer forensics. Um, but, but to tell you the truth, if I, if I did it now, it'd probably be something completely different because I'm even tireder than I was then. Um, so. Um, the things that I'm mainly going to sort of cover in this is going to be um, about the um, advanced storage technology, advancing storage technology, and how that actually affects our, our work and, uh, and and the stuff that we do. Um, so increasing hard drive f sizes, and obviously the um, you know the the newer sort of uh, flash sort of stuff that's coming out, um, flash storage and flash memory um, that affects us a great deal as well. Um, the increase of small scale digital devices, well, small scale digital devices, that's the, uh, the term you can take away now. It's effectively uh, mobile devices, um, you know, iPads, mobile phones, um, stuff like that. Um, there's a great deal of usage of it, um, as, as you know. I mean, uh, if, uh, you know, if, if, you, if anyone was at Breakpoint in the last, uh, you know, two days ago, the majority of the actual talks were actually focused around mobile technology and, um, you know, and, and the different stuff that we can do with mobile technology. And a lot of the talks at Ruxcon were as well. So, um, you know, so as you all know, I mean, we're all sitting here probably with one or at least one or two very powerful computers in our pocket that, um, you know, are way more powerful than the 486 that we used to have, like, you know, 15 years ago. If anyone knows what a 486 is still. I'm sure there's a few guys who are out here still do know. Um, and um, uh, one of the other things is uh, growing corporate, um, corporate environments. So 
a lot of the collection that we have to deal with, um, because I work for, for a big corporation, um, we, we tend to deal with very, very large scale um, collection and, uh, and investigation. Um, so we will have to go into a large like multinational company that has infrastructure all over the world. Um, and, you know, and we're told to sort of, uh, you know, capture data within, you know, particular parameters from this infrastructure, from all parts of the infrastructure. So, you know, understanding how, it, how that actually works, understanding how the actual network works, um, understanding how data talks to other data, how people talk to other people, um, how their archival systems work, where all their data sources are. Um, it's one of the, the primary focuses of the, the kind of work that we actually do in, um, you know, in, in relation to computer forensics and e-discovery in, in large accounting firms. And the last thing is um, in increasing review platform uh, re review volumes, which um, is it mainly affects uh, electronic discovery, but in some ways it affects computer forensics as well. Um, for instance, um, we tend to do a lot of uh, large FCPA um, type type investigations. Um, FCPA is a uh, as a as a sort of law that came in in the in the US that basically um, the, I think the basis of it is is that um, if you're a, a company that's that's in the US and you're trading anywhere outside of the US, um, if you actually breach any laws in the the actual companies that you're trading in, you will actually be tried under US law. Um, and so what that means is, is that when there is this type of investigation, um, then there, there tends to be a large scale collection of, of almost the entire organisation. So, um, so you might look, be looking at, um, you know, the collection of data from say three, four hundred employees, um, you know, in a very uh, fast amount of time, trying to pull that data apart and then trying to, uh, to basically get to the, um, you know, to, to the meat of the matter as, as quickly as possible. And uh, so that's going to be some of the stuff I'll be talking about in relation to uh, increasing review platforms. So, where it hurts us. So um, I'm going to show you this this lot horrible little thing. Um, if you've ever, if anyone has ever been to a, a talk on uh, on electronic discovery, then no doubt someone would have shown you this horrible bit of graphic here. Um, now. I don't tend to agree with the the EDRM, the Electronic Discovery Reference Model, because it doesn't really fit into um, you know the majority of the actual work that we do. But it is it is pretty good. I mean, um, you know, as a standard, it's kind of you know it's it's it sort of explains it in, in a way, but it just doesn't really follow. Like you, your investigations don't normally follow this sort of path, but it, it'd be nice if they did. Um, so where um, you know the, this new sort of technology really does hurt us is. Um, is the majority of it is around collection. Um, uh, collection, as I mentioned before, is one of the primary focuses of what we do: collecting data and uh, and collecting it in a very safe way um, that we can then, um, you know, prove where we actually got it from. Um, make sure the the data integrity is there, and then make sure if we actually have to stand up in court, put our hand on our hearts, and say, you know, this is where that data came from, and um, you know, and uh, then then we're confident that we're able to, to do that. So um, so collection is one of the main things that sort of affects. The second thing, it it kind of has an on flowing effect is, is is analysis. So um, so some of the new sort of technology does affect the way analysis works, and so an analysis is slowly changing. Um, you know, as as uh, technology progresses, as you'd imagine, and um, and lastly, um, you know, review. I mean. Um, it does affect us in, in some ways in review, um, mainly um, just because of the scale of the amount of data that we actually have and the amount of files that we have, and, uh, and I'll go into a little bit of that later. Um, so, yeah, hor horribly boring um, uh, slide, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of it. Um, so, yeah, and... Um, and, um, and then, um, the next thing after that... <laughs> So we'll talk about hard drive technology. Sorry, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> someone told me I had to put that in there, so I did. Um, so one of the, um, the the problems we have, I mean, the, well, the two main problems I guess we have with um, uh, with with large hard drives is the um, the average size of hard drive, you know, uh, workstation hard drives is increasing. Um, a while ago it used to be just like 100 megs, and then you know then it was like you know more, and then it was more, and you know um, the average size of the um, of hard drives we're coming across in workstations now are either 160 gig or 250 gig, um, which is actually quite big in the scale of things. Um, and when you're looking at trying to capture, you know, 30 40 computers in in one night, um, you know, and uh, and have it all done by the morning. Then uh, then yeah, you know, having that many 250 gig drives is, can be a real hassle. Um, and obviously, uh, 500 gig hard drives. We did a lot. I've done a lot of jobs recently where um, you know we've actually gone out and you know these guys will have 256 gig hard drives, and then you'll have one guy who's in the IT department who scrounged up as many hard drives as he possibly can, and he's got two terabyte hard drives in there, um, you know, one like 500 gig hard drive in there, and you end up with like you know like six 
terabytes worth of storage on a guy's workstation and you have to image the whole lot. So, um, so that's, that's one of the main sort of problems. So um, one of the things that um, um, we have to sort of look at in, in relation to this is, is, is the value of actually imaging um, you know, unallocated sectors, uh, especially in, um, with, with these larger drives. You've got like a two terabyte drive. Um, you know, there's only like 50 gig of data on it. Do we really need to, uh, to uh, you know, image the unallocated sectors of the drive? And that all really depends on the, um, on the focus of the actual investigation that you're doing. Um, if you're actually doing a, an investigation that tends to be really focused on, um, on deleted data and data, data that's potentially deleted, then absolutely, you know, you, you're going to need to get those unallocated sectors regardless of whatever you do. Um, however, we, we tend to, to, um, to think a little bit more about it now. The, the old way of, um, of, of computer forensics was just like, let's just grab absolutely everything and um, and because of the, the size of hard drives now that's becoming harder and harder for us to do um, so um one of the other things we're using to, uh, to to help along with this sort of stuff is um, is standalone uh, high-speed imaging systems like the uh, the Solo system or the, uh, the Talon system, which is basically like a, um, a standalone hardware unit that we plug one drive in, we plug another drive in, and it images one drive to the other, and it's all, it's all automated. Um, so and and they, they tend to be very high speed. Um, so those those kind of units can actually help us a lot when we're actually out imaging on site. Um, you know, as you can imagine. Um, Image compression, we've actually found um, playing around with, with various sort of compression ratios and stuff like that, um, especially with large hard drives with a lot of null sectors, that um, it's actually faster, which it's, it blows my mind, I don't know why, but it's actually faster to actually compress an image than it is to, uh, to image raw. Um, and the reason is, is because um, when it comes across huge amounts of uh, continuous nulls, it's actually um, very easy to actually compress those um, quite quickly. So, um, so you actually see with a, um, a, a larger image, um, you'll actually see the, the, the imaging will actually go quite slow at the beginning when you've actually got a lot of allocated sectors. And then when you actually hit the end of the drive and you've got continuous runs of nulls, um, the imaging will actually speed up and um, you know, the actual system will actually start to fly. So, um, so you know, I, I, I definitely recommend playing around with, uh, you know, with the, uh, the different sort of compression ratios. Um, the expert witness format supports compression. Um, not unfortunately in NCASE, which is the actual, uh, um, you know, the program that the EWF format is actually native to. You can't actually set the compression um, for uh, your images in NCASE. You can, however, in, uh, in FTK Imager. And, uh, and there's also a very handy uh, Linux library called libEWF. Um, which, which also allows you to do a lot of different stuff with the expert witness format, so, um, um, which is very handy. And lastly, script-driven Linux boot disk acquisition. So um, as I mentioned before, with some of these um, larger sort of FCPA matters and, uh, and stuff along those lines, we might have to go into an organisation in one night and, uh, and our mandate is basically we've got to go in there, we've got to capture, you know, let's say, 70, 80 hard drives um, and we've got to do it from, uh, you know, we've only got from six you know, in the evening when everyone leaves till six in the morning when everyone gets in to actually capture all of those drives. And, um, and when you consider that, um, you know, the, the average, um, like a 250 gig drive takes around about an hour and a half to image, um, you know, um, it's, it's a lot of time that you actually got to be out there, like, um, like sort of doing this stuff. So, um, so one of the things that, um, that a lot of organisations are doing now, and we've actually written our own sort of custom scripts that allow us to do this, is, um, is we'll actually um, go in, um, say we've got 150 computers, we'll plug in 150 external USB hard drives, we'll load up 150 either USB keys or, um, or Linux boot disks, boot all of the systems up at once, uh, attach the actual source drives, run the actual scripts, and the whole lot will just actually image like you know, at once kind of thing, and um, and that's one of the ways that we can uh, we can actually capture images in a in a very very fast manner. Um, well, it's not really fast; it's actually quite slow. But um, um, but because you're doing um, you know all of the machines concurrently, it's uh, it's effectively you're doing it all at once rather than having to do one computer, then do the next computer, then do the next computer, which can take you know hours, days, um, sometimes weeks. Um, so um, the next problem, which um, you know, obviously is going to be always going to be a problem, is uh, newer interfaces on hard drives, and um, um, and one of the things that we're coming across is the, the phasing out of um, you know um, standards like FireWire and eSATA. Um, as you probably know, like um, you know, your Macs don't have um, you know FireWire ports on them anymore. They've got those cool ports where you can like uh, plug a dongle in and own your whole system. Uh, if you ever if you saw Snares talk this morning. Um, 
So um, you know that that sort of a, can, can be a bit of an issue for us as well, because um, like the the formats are constantly changing. So um, so we sort of have to, to sort of keep on it, um, and uh, and to do that we basically you know have a lot of specialised adapters. Um, recently, um, so I'm one of the guys that I worked with actually found um, these really cool cables that are actually eSATA to USB three that we can actually do full transfer rate over. So um, so that's very very handy for us. Um, so that's that's one of the main sort of problems with with large hard drives. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is, um, is solid, solid state drives. Um, people ask us about this stuff all the time. Um, actually, hang on. Might need my scotch. Um, um, not last year, but the year before, or maybe it was last year. Um, we was, I was having a, uh, a drunken conversation with one of the uh, the other Rutcon attendees, and uh, and one of the things they said to me, and uh, jokingly, was, um, Adam, because because uh, the new introduction of SSD drives and the fact that um, you know the drive is in a is in a, is a constant state of flux, when you actually image a drive um, and you create an MD5 checksum uh, for that for that image, um, when you actually uh, compare it against the original again, then it won't match because the, the the drive will have changed by the time you've actually gone to, to generate the uh, the checksum for the for the next drive, and and that's sort of true in a way, um, and um, and that's one of the you know the, the, the problems that we sort of we, we kind of face, but um, but it's not as bad as as what people think it is, and um, so I'll, I'll actually talk about that a little bit later. I think I've jumped the gun a little bit there, but um, um, wear leveling and right amplification, which is um, I'm sure you've all heard of wear leveling. Um, you know, it affects basically um, because of the way the flash memory works. It works in a very different way to your standard sort of um, you know block devices that we've been used for, used to for years and years, and uh, and memory is actually allocated in in different ways depending on the file system implementations, the way the SSD is being created, um, you know, the way the interface works. A whole whole heap of different sort of factors affect that for us. Um, right amplification. Um, I don't know if you've ever anyone heard of right amplification. It's basically where the um, the uh, the SSD controller goes into a bit of a hissy fit, and uh, and actually instead of writing one sector, or like ten sectors, um, which rather than being bad for us, can actually be good for us because um, it means that you know we get like more of more data fragments rather than less. So um, so I guess the problem with wear leveling and write amplification is it gives us you know less. Um, like as soon as you delete a file, there's less chance of you actually being able to recover that um, successfully. Um, you know, in a in a in a uh, after after a certain period of time. Um, but what it does potentially give us is it gives us more fragments of uh, of smaller fragments of data across the across the drive, which can potentially give us you know even more information. So it's kind of a double-edged sword for us in in some ways. Um, Changes in file system implementation. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the um, well. Uh, the guys at Breakpoint would have seen um, uh, Bradley Schatz's talk on uh, on the YAFS uh, two file system, which is actually for for Android, and the way that that actually um, that actually works. Um, and effectively, the, the implementation of the file system means that the um, the actual uh, the file system itself actually leaves a lot of data on the actual um, on the drive itself because of the way it uh, it actually erases stuff using erase blocks um, and stuff like that. So you know that's that's one uh, example. Another great example actually is um, is is the newer versions of uh, of NTFS. So um, NTFS from Windows 7 onwards, um, they've completely disabled the last access time uh, in NTFS. Now, um, previously in, in FAT32 file systems and a lot of the old NT file systems, um, we've, we've relied on the last access date to tell us when a file was last accessed. Um, and that's all out the window now. So, because um, um, basically the last access date just tends to get set to the creation date and is never touched again. And the reason that it's never touched again is because of the, the wear leveling problems with SSD drives and the fact that um, if you're accessing a file and you're constantly writing to, um, to the disk, then with flash memory, you're going you're gonna to degrade that memory a lot quicker than, than, you know, than what you would with a hard drive and, uh, and potentially you're going to be throwing your, you know, your disk away like two, three years beforehand. So, so um, last access has been completely completely disabled in NTFS now, and so we have to look at like different areas and different data sources for, for looking at when files were last accessed, when they were actually copied off. Um, you know, the amount of reports that, that I've read saying, um, you know, th this file was last accessed on this date because the last access, you know, time on the file stamp is this, uh, and then they don't actually realise that the, the implementation's actually changed and they've just made a completely wrong statement. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, you know, one of the, the other things that sort of affects us with solid state drives. 
So, um, and verification problems, which, um, which is the problem I sort of mentioned before, where if you image uh, an SSD drive um, and generate an MD5 checksum of that SSD drive, and then you take that SSD drive and pipe it through, um, you know, SHA-1 or MD5 again, um, the chances are you're probably not going to get exactly the same MD5. In fact, you, 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 there's, it's, there's a very rare chance that you would get the same MD5 because, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the SSD drive is in a constant state of flux. It's the, the controller itself is actually doing stuff, the, the drive's doing things without you even knowing about it. So, um, um, but, I mean, that all comes, comes down to actually understanding how verification works. And, uh, and, and back to uh, this conversation I was having with this guy, I was saying, well, obviously, you know, no um, you know, hard drive image is going to be admissible in core anymore because you're not going to be able to compare them back to the original image. Um, and, and that really, um, you know, uh, sort of, it's, 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 it's sort of false. And the reason is, is because um, none of the actual programs actually um, compare back to the original hard drive. And, uh, and when you do actually compare back to the original hard drive, you tend to actually get a lot of problems. So, um, for instance, um, I was talking uh, about the, um, the boot, um, the Linux boot uh, drives that we use um, earlier, which is basically we use a Linux script um, that runs uh, DC3DD, which is a, um, a Linux sort of um, you know DD uh, implementation that's been um, that's been written specifically for computer forensics, and um, a certain switch on that um, on DC3DD will mean that DC3DD will actually go back to um, the original source drive and reread the source drive and generate an MD5 checksum from that, and then compare it against the um, the MD5 checksum that's generated on the fly. Um, now, the problem with that is, is that um, even on drives that aren't SSD drives, there's every chance that the drive's going to change state from, uh, from when you first image it to your second image it. Um, a great example of that is, is sector errors. If you've got a sector error on a, on a drive, they tend to snowball. So if you image a drive that has one sector error, next time you image it, it's probably going to have two sector errors. Uh, and then the next time you image it, it's probably going to have three sector errors. And then also um, going back and actually rereading the entire surface of the drive again so that you compare it back again. Um, means that you're potentially creating more sector errors, and so you're never ever going to get that 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 pure verify. So, um, so we were actually finding we were having very very high failure rates with um, with this particular script because we were going back and actually looking at the original source data. Um, but one of the things is is that um, almost all of the programs that are out there, Encase, um, FTK, um, uh, Xways, um, when they actually perform imaging. That what they actually do is they generate an MD5 checksum or a SHA-1 checksum, or actually both, on the fly. Um, and that's actually um, within the actual file format, and it's actually stored um, you know, in files. And um, so, so at the end of the imaging process, we get um, you know, two checksums, a SHA-1 and an MD5. Um, when we actually verify that, um, what the actual program is doing is it's not going back to the source media and then rereading the entire source media again. What it's actually doing is it's actually going um, and, and looking at the actual images that you've generated, um, recreating an MD5 checksum from them, and then making sure that that image is not changed from the, the point where you first took it. And that's really the important factor about it, is what we're actually doing is we're drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is a snapshot of this image as it stands at this point in time. Um, and um, so, so basically what we're saying is that, you know, um, um, because of the way that the, the, the image is, um, I'm, I've lost my train of thought now, how about that? Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, so basically what we're saying is, is you can't really go back to the original. Um, none of the actual software actually goes back to the original. What the checksums do is they allow us to prove that after we've actually captured the data, that that data has not been modified. And that is the important point that the courts are interested in. They're interested in the fact that, you know, once you've actually obtained this, that there's no other thing that's actually um, that's changed that information. So, um, so that's one of the things, I guess, to, to understand about verification and, um, and which kind of blows the theory away that you know that other fellow was sort of we were talking about as I say he was saying it jokingly anyway but um, but it was an interesting sort of um, thing to discuss and it's kind of like if you think of it as a photograph um, if you um, took a photo of someone who's just stabbed someone and they're running down the street with a bloody knife in their hand um, and you submit that in court um, there's no way that you can actually go back and recreate that photo um, you know, you can't go back in time and say, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the same guy to run down the same street with the same bloody knife in his hand and take the same photo. Like, how, how can you do that? All you're doing is basically saying that from the point that that photograph was taken, nothing has changed within that photograph. And that's, that's what we mean by verification. Um, 
small scale digital devices, which um, I talked to talked about before, um, which is like mobile devices and, and stuff along those lines. So obviously we're seeing a, a significant increase in the uptake of SSDs in the workplace. Um, the virtual boundaries of organisations have been extended, so um, the lines between the, the home and office work, the worker have been abused, uh, <laughs> blurred. Um, I can't imagine how many people are sitting in here like checking their, their work emails and, uh, and stuff like that on their iPhones or, um, um, you know, or logged into work, you know, doing various things. Um, I myself, like I've got my own my own mobile phone, but um, you know, um, like when I was at Deloitte, for instance, I had all of my, my my email on my mobile phone as well. So is that my device or is it Deloitte's device? It sort of creates starts creating like a legal grey area as to you know where the actual company's data is actually sitting, especially when you're looking at very very confidential data. Um, like firms like mine you know, tend to use, like use like uh, programs that are actually sandboxed, so um, so that the, the data doesn't actually leak out of the actual sandboxed uh, environment into the actual mobile phone. Itself, but um, um, you know, th there's always ways that this, this sort of data can get across, and um, and it's one of the things that you know that, that people sort of have to think about a lot. Um, so you know, towards that, like a recent survey showed, uh, actually it wasn't that recent, it was a couple of years ago, but it showed 70, uh, 65 percent of companies have sensitive data stored on SSDDs, um, which means that 65 percent of, of companies have very, very sensitive data that could potentially be, just be sitting on someone's, um, you know, like a, a partner's mobile phone that they could potentially leave on, the, on a train or, or something along those lines. So, um, so it does raise, you know, um, a lot of sort of risk and, um, you know, uh, questions in relation to that. Um, and also, um, SSDDs, um, as, as I say here, um, changing firmware and there's, there's no standard interface. SSDDs are changing constantly. There's new phones coming out every, you know, every couple of months. Um, there's new software getting patched to those phones every couple of months. There's new flash updates. Um, you know, the amount of actual mobile phones that are actually out there and the amount of models, the amount of different uh, operating systems that are running on them, the amount of different apps that are running on them, um, you know, the frequency is, is huge. So it's actually very, very hard to, to create like a, a standardised way of actually imaging these devices because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's an ongoing, um, you know, onslaught of, uh, of upgrades and, you know, there's no standardisation at all. It's not like we have, you know, Windows and Mac. We've got all kinds of crazy stuff. So, um, so that's that's obviously a, a problem as well. Um, no standard interface, um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. One of the, the actual kits that we actually use, um, we have hundreds and hundreds of different um, of, of different interface cables. We have like a whole like thing of interface cables that um, you know for every single mobile phone that comes out. And so, you know, five new phones come out. Um, you know, the the, manuf the the manufacturer of the software we use and the hardware we use, you know, in within a couple of months, they'll actually send us a new batch of cables. So our cable database, if you will, is just growing and growing and growing constantly. Um, so, you know, that's obviously a big problem for us as well. Um, and poses new challenges for forensic sound collection. Um, as I mentioned before, we have the, the problems with, um, you know, the usual sort of flash memory. Um, obviously, all these all these devices have flash memory in them as well. Um, they have different, um, you know, file system implementations, um, different ways of actually using the memory, um, you know, and, and all of those have to be understood to be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to perform a, a decent sort of forensic examination on them and to be able to sort of, as I mentioned before, put your hand on your heart and stand up in front of court and say, you know, yes, this data that I'm looking at is, is exactly exactly what I say it is. So um, um, also there's, there's the fact that there's network connectivity with, um, with mobile devices. Um, just turning a mobile device on um, or, and accessing a network could potentially overwrite uh, really, really important information such as GPS data, um, SMS data, if, you're, um, if you've got like a fixed amount of SMSs and um, you know when you, when you get a new SMS, the, the old ones like tail off the end and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, you know, that can be a real problem for us as well. So, um, you know, we have to make sure you remove the SIMs and, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that you have to be really, really aware of when, when looking at SSDDs. Um, and, um, and one of the, the, the big problems, I guess, with the, the way that SSDDs actually work is, um, um, is for us to get into to SSDDs and the actual software that we actually use, um, the, the guys who are actually creating the actual software for us to actually analyse and forensically capture SSDDs are actually um, writing rootkits, uh, basically to crack into a mobile phone to be able to access the low-level um, device itself. And so, so in a way, um, you know, uh, guys who are cre creating this mobile phone forensic software are actually, you know, they've, they've got teams of guys who are just sitting there doing nothing but trying to actually crack your phone so that we can actually forensically image it. Um, 
So the kind of stuff that we use, um, um, I put a Faraday cage there. We've actually got a really cool Faraday cage that's like a like a humidity crib in our uh, in our Melbourne office that you've got like you can put gloves in and stuff like that, and you can actually like uh, image the actual mobile phone in a completely RF shielded environment, um, which means that there's no network connectivity, and um, you know hopefully there's no data changes to the actual to the system when you actually load it. Um, so there's a lot of mobile acquisition kits out there. Um, Access Data, who uh, who make FTK, have one called MPE, which is um, it's was it Mobile Physical Examiner, I think it's called. Um, there's uh, XRY, um, which is uh, quite a popular tool out there. There's um, Paraben Device Seizure, which is um, one of the ultimate shelfware products that you'll uh, you'll ever find. Um, I'm, I'm sure it works really well now, but uh, I remember back in the day. I, uh, we bought a, uh, one of the first versions of Paraben uh, device seizure and we actually used it on a PDA that I spent uh, hours and hours imaging this PDA, um, you know, like uh, over and over and um, we verified the image at the end of it and, uh, you know, got it back um, to, to the office to actually investigate it and the entire image was filled with nulls. So, um, not very happy with Paraben there, but um, the actual uh, kit that we use is, um, it, which is you've, you, we've got a picture of here, is the, the Cellbrite UFED kit. Um, Cellbrite's um, a company from, from Israel, um, and so they've got a bunch of like uh, crazy Israeli boffin guys who basically sit there doing nothing but figuring out how to rootkit your phone so that we can take forensic images of it. Um, so there's a number of different ways that um, you know the the, uh, the the UFED kit actually works, um, but m most of it's around um, using you know, custom bootloaders to actually uh, um, to load a um, you know a custom boot device on the mobile device to, to be able to low level access the, the data from there, and um, and lastly. There's, uh, there's chip off extraction, which is um, which is a fairly sort of uh, hairy way of kind of doing things. Um, there's a couple of actual um, like uh, hardware systems out there um, that are very very specific that do sh uh, chip off, that are developed to do chip off. Um, they're, they're worth millions, and there's lots and lots of training in to actually how to use them. Or you can just be a bit gangster and um, you know and get into it yourself with a bit of a soldering iron and stuff like that. Which um, um, you know when you're actually obviously in the the computer forensic field like like me, you don't want to stand up in court and go, yeah, you know, I ground that chip off. Me and like you know and then we, we heated it up and then no, you don't want to go there at all because the fact is is that um, you know unless the phone is really really bricked you're not going to want to um, you know start hacking the chips off the, the circuit boards that's for sure so um, um, but it's certainly something that you know um, like we've 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 had guys who who can definitely do um, and you know that the field is is certainly emerging so um, you know so, so there's there's probably going to be more and more products that come out for uh, to enable us to actually just pull the chips directly off mobile phones and uh, and low level image them and analyze the, um, you know, the, the low-level data structures. Um, so, um, growing corporate environments. Um, as I mentioned before, um, um, ooh, um, we have to do a lot of large-scale collection um, uh, at, at a lot of big organisations. Um, I'm going to give you a case example, actually, of, um, of one of the, the, um, the bigger ones that we actually had to do. And um, we were actually doing a lot of collection out of these guys and um, and. The, the, the funny thing about it was is that the um, um, the, the company itself, I and mean, we would actually go there and go, right, we need these files um, from these people uh, for this date range, um, these emails, you know, um, can you get it for us? And they'll go, yep, no worries, that'll take nine months. And like, nine months? And it's like, are you serious? And it's like, um, and the reason is is because they've got such a huge complex data system, um, you know, like network with, with so many different like data sources all over the place um, that, you know, it's 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 really actually quite hard for us to do that. So um, so just quickly, um, I'm going to go through a uh, um, an, uh, a sort of a quick sort of uh, thing of, of of what we actually did out at this 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 place. We've, the, one of the first things we did is we mapped the data sources. These guys had uh, a lot of loose data storage network volumes. Basically, um, they were constantly getting migrated. Um, so um, you know there was a lot of issues around that. Um, but they had like NASA's SANS. Um, they had um, SANS that were connected via WAN to in you know different countries, um, all kinds of stuff. And we basically had to successfully collect all of the data off all of that stuff. So that was the first data source. Second data sources, they actually had a, uh, um, a, a really heavily customised document management system. Um, on the slide before, I actually mentioned that these guys actually had a self-imposed hold order, which means that these guys hadn't deleted a single file in seven years, 
right? So um, they hadn't thrown away a single backup tape, they hadn't deleted a single file. Um, they actually even got to the point where they were uh, photocopying post-it notes and, um, and, uh, and scanning them in and actually putting them into their databases as well. So these guys threw away nothing. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the, the amount of data that we had was huge. So they actually had a document management system that helped them actually do that. And, uh, and one of the things that it actually did is every time you would actually create like a, a new version of a document, um, so if you had a draft document, for instance, that you had 20 revisions on, you would actually create 21 documents because it would not let you save over a draft version. As soon as you opened a new version, it would lock off the old version and you know create a new one. So, so that was a real issue for us. Um, their mail server was this horrible uh, Lotus Notes implementation. Um, <laughs> we actually have to use Lotus Notes at work. God, I hate it. Um, so does everyone else here from Ernst & Young, I can imagine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, these, these guys had a really weird like Lotus Notes sort of implementation that was actually doing stuff like capturing uh, individual emails and actually storing them in, uh, in EMC, like uh, archival systems, like, um, you know, in the back end without them even knowing it through the, um, through the mail router. Um, you know, all kinds of like crazy stuff they had in their mail archive. They had a, a normal archival system, which they were actually trawling through their uh, their network data as well as ingesting you know other data into it. So so we had to get to that data as well. Um, and the last thing they had is, is, is backup tapes. These guys had like, um, it was like, uh, well they still do, they have like, um, you know, I think it was about 3K uh, square worth of actual storage, which was just filled with DLTs and LTO tapes because they'd never thrown away like a single backup tape since um, they imposed the whole hold order, which was, so it's a huge amount of backup tapes as you can imagine. So what we had to do in relation to this is the first thing we actually had to do is, um, is harness the existing indexes. So a lot of these systems like the document management system, the mail archive and the archival system actually did its own indexing. So um, they already had the, the, the text indexes in the back end that we could actually query to actually pull the data out. So um, that was actually really, really handy for us. Um, the document management system was a, was a bit of a funny thing because it only um, had held the index for the latest version of a document and not the previous version. So the, we had to actually do a little bit of uh, stuff around that as well, but I won't go into that in this. So th the next thing we actually do is we had to create indexes for, for data that wasn't indexed. So for the SAN and network shares, um, they actually used a thing called a directory crawler, which basically goes over um, like a, a network drive and, and creates an index, a queryable index of, of everything on that network drive. And so they would run that every night and then every um, you know, couple of days they would have a new index that we could actually query and pull the data out of. And in relation to the backup tapes, um, they were using a, th a system called Index Engines, which, uh, which we actually have as well, uh, which is a great system that basically, um, it's a, a, a Linux sort of black box system that um, these guys have basically reversed engineered almost every tape format that's actually out there. And, uh, and you can actually, you feed tapes through it and it actually generates like a huge index of everything in the tapes. So you could actually t take one tape out of like, um, you know, like a, a 20 tape backup set and just read that tape individually. Um, you don't need the software anymore. Um, the whole idea of having proprietary software is, is all kind of out the window and, and those indexes became queryable as well. So once we have, once we'd indexed all the data sources, the next thing we had to do was create a metadata map. So, um, for instance, file name in, in one thing might be file underscore fn in another thing, which might be file underscore f or something like that in another thing. So we had to create like a, a map of the of all the different metadata from all of the different um, index sources and how that all actually fit together. Um, and then after that, we basically created, like, well, we helped them create like a unified search utility, which effectively was like a, a single front end where we could enter a single query, and then it took that query and it translated it to all of the different query languages that it needed to, to look at all of the different data sources, went away, grabbed all of the data, um, and then pulled it all back again, um, stored it all in a, in, a, um, in a discovery index. And the reason that there's, uh, we created a discovery index is basically so, um, um, you know, once you've actually done a discovery, you don't have to do it again. Like you don't have to recreate and re-harvest re those files every time. Um, and so once you actually do that, then they, they export it for review. It was actually more exporting it for processing because um, once they'd done the initial searches, done the initial cut, pulled the initial files out, then we had to take that and then process that and, and turn it into either Ringtail or, um, uh, or one of the other large review platforms. So um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to nail through these. Um, increasing review platforms, so here's a really cool um, <laughs> bit, bit of statistics. If you get 80 gig worth of Word documents filled with text, printed them out on standard A4 and piled them one on top of the other, you would actually get a, a pile that is the equivalent height of Mount Kosciuszko. 
So if you consider the fact that we are looking at dealing with, with data sets that uh, potentially are uh, a terabyte in size and almost always consisting of either just emails and, and uh, word processing documents, then that kind of puts that into sort of perspective. Um, in relation to legal review, the way that legal review is done is it actually has to be done by, um, by paralegals. And, uh, and, and, a, uh, and so there's a, there's a high volume charge in relation to that. So um, even if you're looking at, say, 20 cents a page, if you can imagine 20 cents a page, for a, a, a pile of uh, pages that's the size of Mount Kosciuszko, you're looking at a few million dollars to, uh, you know, to, to review data sets. So there's a lot of work being done around how we can actually speed that up and you know, how we can get into data a lot quicker. Um, so one of the things that, that a lot of people are actually doing um, is um, farming legal review offshore. So um, so now they've actually got like a, a, a building full of uh, Indian paralegals that are um, that can actually do it. Instead of ten cents a page, these guys will do it for like half a cent a page. Um, you know, they're still all paralegals. They've still um, you know they all have the same legal qualifications that the guys do in here in Australia. It's just they're in India. So um, um, and one of the reasons we can actually do that is because of um, you know increased network speeds over the internet and also increased. Um, you know, security. So, um, so um, obviously, you think it's a bit dodgy having guys like sitting there in India, like you know, downloading your uh, you know your secure documents for some you know, like really big sort of legal case, and you know, to their hard drive and reviewing them. Um, so, we, we actually use a lot of technology, like sandbox type technology, with um, you know, Citrix WinFrame and, and stuff along those lines, so that you know, that those those data fragments don't make it to their hard drives. Um, so that that tends to be a um, you know a really big focus of, of a lot of the big four like um, um, you know Deloitte and KPMG and guys like that. Everyone's sort of looking around in like India and the Philippines um, for places where you know it's it's a lot cheaper to actually get the, the same sort of skill sets um, you know for a lot less. And um, the next thing is, um, you know, um, advancing review platforms, text analytics, which is the stuff I talked about before, um, sentiment and analysis. So um, there's actually um, the, the the way these indexing, uh, these advanced analytics index engines actually work now um, is you can actually do stuff like you can actually uh, take a data set of like millions and millions of emails, and you can say what kind of sentiment are, is there around you know certain topics? Like are people talking about certain topics in a bad way? Are they talking about it in a good way? Um, and they're, they're actually using very advanced linguistic engines to actually extract all this information and actually look at the way that people are actually typing emails and um, you know and the kind of language that people actually use so um, so stuff's getting very very advanced in that in, in that respect um, threading which is basically almost very similar to near do duplication where you're basically looking at um, you know the number of actual words um, and the way that they're actually set out in a document and then comparing it against other documents and seeing um, you know whether or not one document is a revision of another document or um, or whether it's actually a thread in a, in a, in a singular thread um, so there's there's a lot of cool, cool software out there, like um, um, uh, there's a name I can't even remember now, but there's a, another Israeli company that actually does a, a lot of really cool stuff around that. Guys, can you remember what the name of that company is? No. Um, social network analysis, which I talked out about before, and uh, and and concept clustering. So, um, so um, the thing I've got at the bottom there is uh, Ringtail, which uses Atenix, uh, relativity, and summation. They all actually have a lot of advanced text analytics stuff actually built into them. So, um, um, and and they're they're emerging more and more. So, um, so the, the more they progress, the more sort of uh, advanced this sort of text analytics stuff is getting. So um, that's actually a quick look at, say, so, you know, um, uh, social network analysis. So this is basically a screen grab from a program called Nuix, um, which uses like a, that, a Java applet to basically just map out. Um, this is from an email set. Um, this is from the Enron email set, and it basically just maps out who's talking to who, how many emails they're actually sending to each other, and based on that, you can actually see, you know, like, um, you know, who's got the highest amount of talking to other people, and if you've got a person of interest, you want to see all all of the different people that they're actually talking to, and then the people that those people are talking to then this kind of maps it out in a, in a nice visual way for you. Um, but the, the last thing I'll sort of talk about is, uh, is the, the concept clustering. Um, so the way that concept clustering actually works is, um, um, as I've laid out here, like a, a linguistics engine actually extracts all of the, um, you know, all of the nouns and phrases and stuff from the actual documents itself. Um, it takes them and it actually weighs them, um, you know, against each other by um, frequency and occurrence and uh, and stuff along those lines. Um, and then documents with uh, similar um, concepts are actually grouped together. So um, if you're doing an investigation, for instance, that relates to, well, I mean, um, some of the examples you've got here, if we're looking at one that relates to, um, you know, a con construction fraud or something along those lines, or um, or you're looking for something in relation to a single company that looks at construction, then um, then then what this does is it actually brings all of that stuff together. 
And um, what this, this graphic down the bottom here with all the, the circles and the dots and stuff like that in it, that's just not some, some cool like shit that I just pulled up. No. <laughs> it's actually, that is actually the graphical interface for a program called um, uh, Atenix, and it looks very, very similar to that. And so it actually clusters documents together, and you can actually drill down through that graphic implementation um, and actually look at how, at how um, you know, documents are actually, um, you know, relate to each other. And for, for high level review, um, if you've got like a specific topic that you know is going to be the, the killer topic that you, you really want your reviewers to look at first, then you can use this kind of, um, you know, stuff to prioritise the actual review and, and get you know the reviewers to look at what hopefully is the most relevant stuff um, you know as, as quickly as possible so um, yeah so that's so that's it um, I think yeah there you go so final thoughts um, document everything um, in computer forensics you just have to take notes take notes of everything like um, you know take notes of when you pick your nose who the guy like what shirt the guy you're sitting next to is wearing um, you know you can't take enough contemporary con uh, contemporaneous notes so um, um, keep up to date with technology, obviously. Um, you're going to have to just keep, you know, looking at stuff and, uh, and it's part of the stuff that we actually do. And um, surf the wave, don't, don't resist it. So, uh, so there you go. Um, any questions? Questions? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to run out with a microphone this time because I'm the dude doing it, so. Over there. He was first. And then you can bring it back to this guy. There, there, look. White guy with the white shirt. White guy with the white shirt. <laughs> I meant white shirt guy. White shirt guy. Go ahead. I was just wondering, with the um, increase in companies starting to encrypt their hard drives and staff members also potentially bringing in their own encrypted hard drives, is there anything you guys can do with that? If um, we, we come across that quite a lot. Um, we use full disk encryption in our own organisation, for instance. Um, and going back to um, w w what I was talking about in relation to live imaging, um, now... Um, ooh, it tends to be that um, we tend to go for, for live imaging now instead of um, um, you know any other kind of imaging. So um, it's if, if we have to go out and capture a laptop and. Um, uh, we don't know the system administrators. We don't know, you know, um, anyone in the actual organisation. We don't know the passwords. Then there's no point us actually capturing the laptop because all we're going to get is garbled rubbish. And if no one can actually unlock it, then there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so when we actually do um, this type of work out at, um, you know, various investigations, what we actually do is um, we tend to actually either get them to actually unlock um, the laptops for us, or they actually provide us with the decryption keys, um, which once we actually image the drives, that we can then go and decrypt the, d the data afterwards. Um, but yeah, obviously it is a bit of a problem. I mean, uh, um, you know, if, if, you've, if you encrypt your hard drive and someone comes out and images it and you don't hand over your password, there's, what, what can they really do about it? There's not very much. So, um, so yeah, um, a lot of this forensic software looks at various things and various ways that, you know, we can actually do that. For instance, if you've got a, like an encrypted hard drive and yet we've got your unencrypted um, computer, one of the things we'll do is we'll just run like a, a string search over all of that and actually um, cr use that as an actual digest to try to brute force your password. Um, so there's there's a number of things that we can do along those lines. Um, NCASE and FTK actually have plugins that support various types of encryption, but you do actually have to know the keys and the passwords to be able to get into it. So, yeah, you, you basically sacrifice recoverability for um, for security when when you're looking at encryption. Yep. Anyone else? Oh, this guy. Come on, mate, run. Go on. I was running before, man. You're even fitter than me. I've only had two hours sleep. We're talking about new technologies. What about cloud computing and BYOD? Um, cloud computing, I did actually have a slide on cloud computing, but I ripped it out because, um, um, because you know, I, I sort of, I, I figured I was going to run out of time. But um, the cloud is another one of those things that's like a double-edged sword for us. Um, uh, in relation to um, capturing email and stuff like that from the cloud, we have to rely on some of the traditional protocols like IMAP and, um, you know, and stuff along those lines to be able to actually go and grab the data. Um, deleted data is pretty much out the window. You don't get deleted data in the cloud anymore. But then on the other hand, um, a lot of the people that are using um, cloud, like um, uh, for instance Office 360, um, which is the, the new Microsoft Office implementation, um, now actually has like um, like features in it where basically you can um, you know set it up to actually um, store every single email that's sent or received you know from from the company and a lot of companies are actually looking at doing that like because um, the storage is increased they also increase you know how much they actually keep so like a lot of companies aren't even deleting all of their data anymore so um, so as I say it's it's a double-edged sword for us but um, but we have to rely on the APIs that talk to the cloud for us to be able to pull the data back and uh, and obviously that's a big big issue yeah. Hey, um, what hey. would you do in a situation with, uh, if you had a sand that had DGP on it and you were just given the hard drives or a shelf 
Sorry, if you had what? If you've got a SAM with deduplication on it, so it stores yep. a database of all the blocks. Yep. What do you do if you come across, say, a SAM that's been corrupted? Um, that you then need to retrieve the data from. Um, we've actually um, done some some pretty hefty sort of recovery on that type of um, of sand before, where we've actually had to rebuild the actual indexes and the way the block indexes actually work. Um, it sometimes it's really difficult, um, but sometimes it's really easy. But it, it actually comes down to actually reverse engineering the way the actual um, the single block the single instance storage actually works, um, because there is actually an index layer that actually sits between um, you know that you don't actually see that actually sits between the actual storage itself and the API that's actually um, you know like writing in. In, and actually trying to recreate that index is, is, is the primary thing. If you can't recreate that index, then the, then the whole thing's out the window. Um, but, um, but we've actually had a lot of success in recovering that kind of data in the past, yeah. Yep. And it's basically reverse engineering it, so, yeah. So with the prevalence of virtual desktops now, what would you do in a situation where the laptop that you're imaging doesn't actually contain any of the data and it's just used as like a dumb terminal to access a, a virtual desktop on another server? Well, that, that comes down to, to actually understanding the, the environment that you're actually going into. So one of the first things we do when we actually go into an environment is we talk to the IT guys and figure out how their actual their desktop systems work, where their actual data is stored. Um, so in, in that example, we, we would probably find out that very, very quickly. Um, um, you know, and then we'd probably just throw the image away and then just go straight to the, the original data source, like where the, the actual, um, you know, the network data source where the actual data is stored. Hi, how are you going? Um, you mentioned something about construction cases. What are some examples? Where of what? Different in types of um, in construction fraud, fraud. Yeah, construction fraud. Um, well, um, just they tend, it tends to be around sort of stuff where um, dudes are um, like a guy will be in charge of say um, you know um, uh, giving out the the tenders. He'll be the, the guy who's in charge of like tendering out for um, for the building of various say like restaurants or um, you know or or stuff along those lines. And then um, you know that guy might be um, say getting the, the various tenders from all different people. And if he's got a mate who uh, who actually is in the construction industry, he might be passing off the tenders to them so that they can actually put in the, the correct tender to be able to, and that's basically fraud. So, um, oh, so okay. th that's, that's an example of one type of, um, you know, uh, of fraud that we come across in that space, yeah. Great. Yep. Thanks for that. Yep. Anyone else? Well, there you go. I'm done. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for me. Woo!